Merhabalar, Kıraathane İstanbul Edebiyat Evi'ne hoş geldiniz. Bizim kitap konuşmaları, kitap sohbetleri serimizin bir buluşmasında beraberiz. Bugün konuşacağımız kitap Talat Paşa adını taşıyor. Alt başlığı İhtiyatçılığın Beyni ve Soykırım'ın Mimarı. İletişim yayınlarından kısa bir süre önce çıktı. Ve bugün bu kitabın yazarı İsviçreli tarihçi Hans Lukas Kieser'le beraberiz. Professor Kieser, good afternoon. Good to see you. Hello, good to see you. How are you, sir? I, I understand we find you in in in uh, Basel, in Switzerland. Exactly. exactly. Yes, I'm here for for the whole year now. Yeah. Okay, and then it looks like you're moving out or moving in. The books are gone. <laughs> uh, yeah, you see that the books still are uh, not have not arrived. Uh, the, partly due to COVID, uh, but they will come. Uh, and so I'm a little bit in between. A really cosmopolitan life, if you want. But you mm. do keep teaching in Newcastle. And Teach. that's right, sir. Uh, I, I, I have taught last year. So mm. I was uh, quite, uh, involved into intensive teaching, but not this year. This is a research year for me. OK, OK. Mm. Well, okay, congratulations on your book. Uh, and I know it came out in English in 2018, I think from Princeton University yes. Press. I also have an English copy here. And I would like to start with the title actually, because uh, in Turkish, the title, as I just read to our viewers, is Talat Paşa İhtiyatçılığın Beyni ve Soykırımın Mimarı. Whereas in English, of course, uh, let me see that there should be here. It's Talat Paşa, father of modern Turkey and architect of genocide. Uh, İletişim yayınları, I, I presume, uh, made an editorial decision to change uh, the heading just a little bit and not use the, the words father of modern Turkey. And uh, they were, I mean, to give them uh, you know, due credit, uh, they weren't secretive about this. They also put the English title on the book. So, you know, the readers can easily sure. see the change there. And I can certainly understand the reasons behind that editorial decision because father of modern Turkey uh, here in this country is, is a title, is an honorific that's reserved for Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, as you know very well. So let me begin by asking you about the title. Why do you call Talat Pasha father of modern Turkey? Or if I just, if I may just quote you from your own prologue to the book, why might we call Talat Pasha a first founder of the Turkish nation state? Yes, perhaps uh, <clears throat> let me first say that uh, Ilet Tishim, of course, uh, asked me uh, for this uh, change of title, and I agreed with this change. Uh, yeah, and then uh, I took this title uh, also partly uh, in a conversation with Princeton University Press, because my first title was uh, Talat Pasha, Demolitionist Founder of Modern Turkey. So Demolitionist Founder was my, let's say, scholarly uh, first title. But I accepted their suggestion to put father, uh, uh, because anyway, uh, you, it is uh, it is a quite a usual usual metaphor to say father of a nation, Ben Gurion as the father of modern Israel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the metaphor is uh, is is well understood, uh, uh, and uh, and it has a, as a particular meaning. And uh, it uh, shows uh, very clearly, in a way, uh, that there were other persons, or in particular one person, fathering a modern post-Ottoman Turkey before uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. And this, of course, is a, is a crucial statement of uh, this book. Uh, that is uh, to show precisely the groundwork on which, uh, or the shoulders, as uh, Mustafa Kemal himself later said, on which 
stays, uh, on which uh, rests uh, post-Ottoman Turkey and uh, the Republic of Turkey after the Lausanne Treaty. And that we cannot understand uh, everything until now if we do not see these roots, these direct roots. This is not a vague, back, vague background. These are direct roots. So Turkey is depending still on that uh, groundwork uh, on which I in particular, and you have uh, seen, or uh, yeah, seen it uh, when reading the book, uh, I include Sia uh, Gökalp, the close bosom friend of uh, Talat, uh, who was also in the Central Committee all the time after, uh, from 1909 with uh, Talat. So uh, we must see this groundwork, or in other words, this first fathering of, uh, of uh, post-Ottoman Turkey, because it went hand in hand with the destruction of the, of the Ottoman social fabric. So the Ottoman social fabric was destroyed already years before 1923. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will come to that and I will definitely come back to the Agyokalp who has also a very important presence in the book as it was in Talat Pasha's life and also in the indoctrination of the new Turkish nation state. Um, this is an important book um, in that it is, I understand, the first scholarly uh, political biography of Talat Pasha in English. Uh, the first book, which is focusing on the last years of the Ottoman Empire by putting Talat Pasha in the middle, in the very center, himself, the person, the leader. Uh, but it's also, as you just mentioned, it also, I think, is new and interesting to us because it's, uh, it debunks certain understandings we have about the final years of the Ottoman Empire, and especially about the uh, CUP, the Committee of Union and Progress. Uh, one is that we are all taught, and not, I'm not necessarily saying taught by the state, the, the very much limited official educational system here, but also in our own readings as independent and as, as, as wide as we try our readings to be. We mostly see in, in many histories of the time that there is this talk about the triumvirate, this three men, Enver and Jamal and Talat all together uh, as a trio, as a team. Uh, one important uh, thing about your book is that you um, make it clear that Talat Pasha single-handedly ruled the empire toward the very hand, single-handedly took some decisions and he was much more in control than Enver and Jamal in certain critical moments. And we will come to that. But the other thing, again, which makes the book a novelty, for me at least, is, is what you were just referring to in, in the context of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk also, that the understanding we have um, that Mustafa Kemal was critical of especially Enver's decisions because of the you know, personal rivalry between them, uh, certain misgivings Mustafa Kemal had about uh, Enver's decisions, including the decision to go to war as you describe in your book as, as Talat's own, own making. And then there was a clear break from the legacy of CUP when Mustafa Kemal started his own movement, so to speak. But in this book, you make us see the linkage and the commonalities. And I will come to that. Now, I talk too much. I would like to start this conversation by asking you now about your work process a little bit, because the book, you know, when you look at the, um, at the end, you see the archival work you have done. Of course, you have uh, had access to so many, you know, uh, works done before you. And of course, in Turkey, we know you from your other books like Tukriya Ihtida, Skalam Shparish, also uh, published by Iletishim and your articles um, dealing with Armenian genocide and, and other issues uh, of the time. 
but please tell me about your work, especially the work you did in the archives. What kind of documents, what kind of first-hand documents were you able to, to access and, uh, and how, how long did it take you to do this work and where did you do this work? Yeah, also I had uh, fortunately also some means uh, for research assistances, else I would not have been able to process all the data. I uh, used, let's say, the usual archives uh, that you can find also in other books of the period, uh, meaning Importantly, of course, the Ottoman State Archives in Istanbul, which I very uh, largely use. Uh, with, uh, the, the, there are many, many thousands of documents uh, signed by Talat or dictate and dictated by Talat uh, as a, a minister of the interior. So it's, it was very important to, to, to see this uh, first uh, these, uh, these, uh, these primary sources, uh, uh, be especially because he, he is not a big author. He has, did not write books ex except uh, his apology at the end of his life. But let's say um, there are other politicians who write much more than Talat. Uh, there are his letters then also that I used, um, uh, letters uh, especially, uh, of course, um, those uh, published by Hussein Jai Dialjan um, for the years after uh, the defeat in World War I. Uh, there are all the memoirs, but now what is special uh, and what I uh, could uh, very much benefit from is that I had a chance to get the newly published uncensored diaries of Javid Bey. So this was really a crucial source for me. This is very dense and vibrant writing day to day. So it's not like memoirs, the retrospective that uh, in a way deforms the reality, but it's the day to day writing a very vibrant uh, because the, yeah of of of, of Javid's character and uh, as he, he wrote himself uh, this diary replaced him to a certain extent his wife that he, he lost very very early on so that's the the, the daily, daily dialogue in a way uh, and and a lot of um, uh, also conversations with Talat and letters received from Talats, he summarizes in his diary. So you see how important uh, this uh, source has become for me. Uh, another also, also quite recent uh, source uh, are uh, the diaries of the Sheikh Islam, who was a member of the CLP, so Urguplu. Uh, and uh, this is two uh, gives two important insights, even if it is not, it is not of the let's say of the same density and not the same proximity, of course, to Talat as is uh, Chavitz. But also this uh, uh, Sheikh Al Islam, who, who was uh, more conservative and and a clear adversary of the Agökal within the Central Committee. Uh, for a certain time, he was also in the Central Committee of the CUP, uh, gives a very important, uh, uh, uh, a very important perspective also. And then uh, that's, uh, that's my Swiss source, that's Louis Rambert. Louis Rambert uh, was the director of the Régie des Tabacs which was an important uh, organization within the debt public, uh, la debt public, or, or the Ottoman debts uh, organization. Uh, and uh, he, he, uh, Louis Rambert was a real political insider of Istanbul from the 1890s to the 1910s. 
He himself had been a politician, a member of parliament, the advocate of the engineer who built the, the, the, the Gotthard Tunnel in Switzerland, so this famous tunnel in the, in the, in the 1870s. So a man who knew very well the politics of his time, the European politics of his time, who was familiar with most uh, known politicians, both in France and in, in, in uh, Germany, and, but also partly with, uh, with English politicians, uh, and then who got familiar with, the, with political Istanbul, advised the Sultan Abdul Hamid uh, in the financial questions and advised many others, helped the CUP uh, in the summer of 1913 when they uh, uh, lacked money. So he was very close to all these persons and had a very independent writing and vision, very critical of Europe very critical, of course, also of all what was not democratic, according to his mind. So he, he came from, from Switzerland, you must imagine, Switzerland after this uh, revolution of 1848, the only European revolution, constitutional revolution that succeeded. So he was a child of this democratic success, and in a way he measured uh, he measured uh, what he saw according to these, um, yeah, to these principles, uh, to these uh, severe democratic principles that he had. But he stood in a distance, let's say, to, to, to, to many, even if, if, of course, he was an interesting uh, party in the sense that he had to defend the interests of the, of the Regie d'Etaba. Which, which had all its branches in, in the provinces. So he was very well informed also about what went on in the provinces, uh, not only in Istanbul. Yeah. And then uh, just, just uh, three words, of course, all the other stuff for the sources, the German archives, which were very important, very important, the Austrian, Imperial Austrian, Hungarian archives, the British archives, foreign office, Armenian archives, uh, also thanks to research assistance. And uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's uh, more or less, yeah, enough yeah, quite, uh, to quite, process. Quite, yeah. quite a research for sure. Let, um, uh, I'll go back to all these, but um, let us remind our viewers who Javid Bey was. Uh, we're talking about the, who was the financial minister at some point, who was the economist, who was an, a teacher of economics to, to Talat even at the beginning, and then they become close friends, but he remains a very critical voice uh, and an observer, ob observer of, of Talat's doings and, and distances himself from Talat eventually. Um, all these characters, uh, Javid and the Sheikh al-Islam and, and, and others, uh, as well as the European observers and also writers and diplomats and some journalists of the time that you could, of course, make it a very lively read, which also enables us to look back into, into Talat Pasha, the person, a little bit uh, among a group of people and, and, and to, to see his distinction. Um, let me ask you about that, his personality, his background a little bit. He's different than Enver and Jamal in that, and Mustafa Kemal for that matter, in that he never really uh, went and finished military school. He is not a military man. He comes, uh, he, he comes from modest means, but also he remains a modest man as far as his education and his, uh, his intellectual background is concerned. What would yes. you say? Yes, so so he he his talents uh, oh, he, he had in a way uh, strong uh, natural talents um, of a networker, but also of uh, of a mind uh, 
that uh, was uh, formed by his early years in Saloniki, in which he helped build up the uh, COP that for a time then was called the CPU, but no matter. Uh, uh, the, and, and he was a learner by doing. So he learned his lessons as a networker in the under, underground with secretive, secretive politics, with all sort of means involved, even political murders or at, at least uh, death threats. He personally did not murder anybody as far as I, I know, but uh, he, he could well threaten uh, to murder directly in situations uh, in which he, he saw this uh, necessary. So he is a self-made man, self-made man. That's uh, something that uh, is also, an, that's an old attribute that uh, belongs also, let's say, to Stalin, even if, if Stalin was better educated. It belongs to Adolf Hitler, for example. It belongs to a certain, let's say, number of people growing up in these extremely cataclysmic and turbulent times in greater Europe. Uh, you, you know, I use the term greater or larger Europe to say Europe, Russia, and the Ottoman world. Mm -hmm. So, and this world is breaking up in the early 20th century. And in this time, you see, emerge such personalities, self-made men, uh, who are able to concentrate power in their hands. And uh, it takes years and decades until they are, they come to the point where they really uh, uh, uh, control everything, uh, let's say, uh, in political Istanbul, at the reins of an empire, uh, or in Berlin, or in Moscow. So, uh, of course, that's, uh, that's always a long journey until it happens. But the new thing it is that such persons can fully come to power. And they come to power, and Talat is the first among them at the head of a single party rule. So this is a novum, this is, is a premiere. Uh, so this uh, single party regime in 1913, uh, uh, even if I, I wanted to clearly emphasize that he acted from within a committee, from within a secretive committee. So he did not possess and did not want or, uh, this uh, dictatorial position of those after him. But still, he was the dominant, politically dominant person, but with a certain difference to the dictators, to the okay. interwar and second, uh, uh, uh, second World War dictators. Yeah, and I would like to underline what you just said, because also another important feature of the book is not only its emphasis on the continuation of the Turkish, Ottoman Turkish history on the same ideological um, line, so to speak, but also Talat being the first, as you just said, the first single party leader, the first dictator, if you will, of the 20th century to be followed by many others and some of some of which you mentioned, which all actually turns the book into um, a history that, that for the first time perhaps looks at the Ottoman Empire and the actors in the Ottoman Empire as actors of greater Europe, as actors of World War I, not only uh, people on the side, but people who were, who also influenced other nations, including Germany, uh, and we will we will go back to that. And I thought this was important. But um, from early on in the book, and from early on in Talat's life, when he was still Talat and uh, Mehmet Talat Bey, um, you call him, you describe him as a revolutionist with an imperial bias, and 
both sides of this line is, is interesting to me. And I know terms are important to you, but let me first ask about the imperial bias. What do you mean by that? Yes, it's, it's an important uh, notion because I apply it to all uh, power holders, uh, including the European uh, power holders, French, uh, British, German, to express that they all envisioned politics in terms of power of someone over others. Of course, that is not basically democratic. I was talking about uh, basic democracy, uh, just uh, when mentioning Rambert, for example. Uh, so uh, I wanted to make clear to the readers that this book is definitely not about Turkey bashing or Talat bashing. This book is a road analysis that is very critical also of the European powers, of European potentates, of even uh, the, let's say, the modern uh, French and British national empires who were comparatively democratic at home and comparatively implemented uh, uh, civil liberties, even human rights in the home countries, lawfulness, rule of law, not so in the colonies as, as we know, there of, often it, it was about, about martial law. So I, all, I mention all this because it's important to show the context. Uh, Talat and these, this cohort, they mirrored very strongly also uh, their context their time. And in a way, they mirrored uh, that they exaggerated uh, what they received from the outside. And so let's now come to Talat's imperial bias. Uh, the whole cohort of these young Turks, and even I would go so far to say the post-imperial Kemalists still very strongly suffered from this bias. That these, they imagined the polity uh, from an understanding, from an imperial understanding of administration, not from the very, uh, let's say, basically different, critically different understanding of a polity based on a uh, uh, nego well negotiated social contract among all involved people. Uh, a compromise, of course, but something uh, where it is not the question who rules over whom, but where it's the question how can we maximize our quality of life together. So they never came to this point because of the imperial bias. And, and I, I now logically, I, I logically add that this is true also for Europe. That is why Europe went into the descent dans l'enfer, the descent into hell in the First World War, because they were not able to rethink uh, the political relations. So the imperial bias is, is a general, uh, general uh, feature of the time, and it is very strong in the Evlade um, Fatihan, uh, who, who were very proud and marked by this uh, identity. And it, uh, of course, marked their decisions from 1908 to 1913, uh, when they embraced this new Gekalpian understanding of the imperial nation based on a Turkish Islamic essence. And again, not with the spirit of maximizing in, in, in, in, in a common social contract, the, the coexistence of 
all richnesses which first are human resources, but in the sense of who rules the land. So the Turk Yordo was largely conceived in these uh, ter in these terms. Even if I see people in the Turk Yordo of before 1914, the Turk Yordo uh, organization, uh, the students in Switzerland, which associations, which, which sometimes had broader ideas about the Turk Yordo, not no, not so exclusive ideas. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah, but also in that definition. Uh, you use the word revolutionist rather than a revolutionary. You make a distinction. Mm -hmm. And I must say in the Turkish translation, that doesn't come across because the, the word used for both revolutionists and revolutionary is um, devrimci. Um, why did you make such a distinction, at least in English? Uh, could you explain that? Because it's also the age of revolutions and we have the you know the the, the collapse of the charist russia and and lenin's revolution in, in you know in in, in russia and, and the beginning of soviet union uh soon to follow yeah <clears throat> by the way the night the, the turkey the, the german uh, translation had the same problem so we, we could not uh uh, express this uh, distinction. So the distinction is meant, uh, in fact, uh, uh, first of all, as a distinction between those uh, revolutionaries from the right, uh, pardon, from the left, who had at least from main theoretical uh, uh, writings of their spiritual fathers, uh, the idea of totally new relations between humans, non-exploitative relations, so non-imperial relations, non-imperialist, non-colonialist, etc., etc. So, uh, a new thinking of uh, human relations and, of course, of, of human self-organization. So I call these revolutionary. So I'm a conservative, if you want, a conservative historian who still makes a distinction between revolution from the left and revolution from the right. Even if, and in our history now with Talat, we see that they come together. The Bolsheviks at the moment, where it is about winning wars, where it is about spreading uh, power and influence, they ally with ultranationalists. They ally with revolutionists from the right. Uh, so it is not an absolute distinction, but I hold to the distinction because I want to keep uh, uh, on appreciating the new thinking which we find e among the revolutionary socialists, among Marxists, among all those from the left who had a clearly humanity or, or humankind oriented political thinking. That's not the case at all with our revolutionists uh, in the COP. They are not humanity oriented. They deride Armenians whom they call humanity oriented. They, they, these, these are these weak, these weak people who, who, who, who talk about humanity and human rights and, and they do not understand anything uh, of power, uh, they are not called to be the power holders. We are called, of course, we are the Evladi Fatihan. So you see, that's why I make a difference between revolutionists who copy quite a lot of things, by the way, from the revolutionaries, because they are impressed by the ideals, by the commitment, by the engagement of these uh, especially Bulgarian and Armenian and also Jewish uh, revolutionaries, uh, so left-wing revolutionaries, but they never 
absolutely never uh, identify with the visions of the left-wing revolutionaries. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah. sorry. I, I, I keep muting myself because there is some construction noise in the neighborhood and I'm hoping it's not disturbing of course. too much, but I keep muting myself whenever I'm not speaking. I would like to ask you about the Armenian leftists, for example, the ARF and, and CUP and the relations uh, between them and, and Talat's own relations to some, some Armenian politicians at the time. I'll go to that. But on that note, as you mentioned the German translation, I want to say it is really difficult to, to find, come up with another name, uh, another word for it in, in Turkish. I mean, as I was raising it, I was, I was saying maybe Devrimji and Devrimbaz and, you know, like two different words, but I understand the leftist right, right wing and, and uh, the distinction. And, and in the book, you make it very clear that Talat Pasha's and of course, yeah, Gökhalp's ideology and teaching is, is very much this extreme rightist um, mm -hmm. nationalism that, that carries on in other places in, in Europe soon after. But speaking of revolution, let's go back to 1908, that revolution, one of the major events, of course, in the period and in the book. I want to ask you, because there are some wonderful passages in the book that you quote from um, like European observers and such where, you know, like Armenians, Jews and, and, and Turks and Albanians, everybody, you know, jubilation and um, celebrating together, you know, Hamid is gone, Abdul Hamid is gone, freedom, constitution, a parliamentary system, you know, all this, all this, there is a moment of jubilation. There is what you call the Ottoman spring. I would like to ask you, was there ever a real chance for a constitutional order, for a pluralistic society, for a new new system that would be still multi-ethnic, that would be still, um, that would turn into an equalitarian um, cohabitation of different nations, different religions, different ethnicities in the Ottoman geography? Yeah, also of course, this is now um, an intellectual and spiritual exercise. Uh, it's, you know, it's a history. Yeah, it's, it's history in the hip hypothetical mode. Uh, yes, certainly. The, I, I, I never see uh, history in a determinist way. I, I think that's one of the most important aspects of this book. I always try to show the open windows of, uh, of the moments uh, uh, in history. For example, the last big open wi window were, was the reform agreement in, in February 1914. Without the First World War, everything would, ha everything would have been different for Turkey, for Ottoman Turkey. Even if the CUP and Talat really detested this reform agreement, if Europe would have remained peaceful, there were reasons why it did not remain peaceful. We just mentioned it. They lacked the potential of rethinking their future in new terms of, of political relations. But let's say, nevertheless, there was no world war, uh, then yes, uh, there would have been the implementation of this reform agreement. And with this, uh, Turkey would have remained multi-religious and multi-ethnic, if they wanted or did not want it. Uh, with, with all the power of, um, of, of Europe, um, which was much more uh, developed in the region at the time, they would have to follow under the supervision of neutral inspectors these new, very modern, very modern. So you, you could use the recipes nowadays of how to manage uh, a more egalitarian, a more participative way that also appreciates the language, the re regional languages, etc. Uh, uh, uh, and that looks at the proportion in the, in the security forces, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, 
in the assemblies, in the regional assemblies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all these aspects. I do, by the way, not speak because many uh, historians, including in Turkey, confound the first Mandelstam plan and the final reform agreement, which is much more balanced than was the first Mandelstam plan. Okay, uh, but your question, back to your uh, main question. Uh, the empire as such, to be realistic, could not be held, uh, I think, uh, as a constitutional entity. Th that was really utopian uh, uh, in 1908, even if it was wonderful. It, it was an eschatological moment. It was a moment in which all people, in, or, or let's say most people in the Middle East, saw for a moment how peace would look like, real peace, so that you embrace your neighbor who is different from you, as another religion and another language, perhaps, or first mother language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, as it, it <clears throat> very valid moment, but let's now, um, realistically speaking, the empire in, in, in, the, in the real world of, of the time could not be maintained vis-a-vis -vis Europe. What, however, could have been absolutely defended would have been uh, constitutional Anatolia. So if all these detour, this way over the Calpian dreams of expansion and also the restoration of the Arab, uh, including Egyptian dominions, if all these irrealistic dreams of the first year of the World War, and if the World War itself would have been avoided, and this was not excluded, this was not excluded. Louis Rambert, uh, for example, uh, was a very clear uh, defender of uh, Ottoman neutrality. Even if most uh, Turkish historians or other historians um, who, to my mind, are much too realistic or lazy, intellectually lazy in a way, saying they must enter the First World War. They had no other chance. I do not accept this position. So if they, with a lot of intelligence and, and of course, some uh, armed neutrality, they would have uh, avoided this war. They would, of course, already before have made the choice of at least building up Asia Minor as a constitutional entity, then yes, uh, Yasemin, we would have a very different Asia Minor, a much richer Asia Minor, because all these mines and all these people who were destroyed or had to go or had to flee, they would uh, in a such a constitutional spirit of, of a common social contract, have, uh, they, they would have become the champions of, of, of a modern nation. A little bit, uh, uh, a big Switzerland in contrast to the small Switzerland within uh, Europe. Yeah, yeah let's uh, return our focus to Talat Pasha again, because I, I'm going to come to the World War I and, and uh, the Ottomans' decision to enter. And of course, Talat was very instrumental in that. Talat was a decision maker in that. But even before, um, in your book, you make it clear that he is powerful in 1908, right after when he becomes a deputy. And um, in 1909, when you have the counter-revolution, Otuzbir March Vakası, you know, in April 1909, then you have the Islamists revolting in Istanbul. Talat is very much in control. You say he was the figure in Hagia Stephanos where uh, Yeshilköy, of course, where the Hareket Ordusu enters the city and, and, and, and it's almost like a 
I want to say, using, you know, like very present day terminology now, a gift from God, from CUP, you know, what happened on the streets of Istanbul. But he the same also- is true for, for 1912, uh, the, the coup in 1912, he uses it then for a total reinvention of, yeah. of himself. And he is also, he said, you say, and I, I have it in my notes here somewhere, you say it was Talat who had principally prepared the putsch in, in, in 1913. You know, he was, yeah. he was the actual. So I want to ask you about how it was possible that he was so much in control because there were other figures. He wasn't the, the grand vizier yet. He wasn't Sadr Azam. Okay, he was a minister for a while and then not. Uh, you know, Enver was powerful and uh, quite a hero, you know, in his own right um, at that point. And, and of course, there were others, including the, the, the, the, the, the, the, the, the empirical bureaucracy at the time. Uh, where does the strength come from? And could you also perhaps talk a little bit about his alliances at the time? Later, I want to come to, as I said, uh, to his, his um, dialogue and relationship with, with people like uh, Krikor Zohrab and, and, and others, uh, the Armenian deputies of the time. But uh, why was he so powerful? How, how was it that he was the best committee of them all? Yeah, uh, so now, <clears throat> now let's start uh, in a way with, uh, with his uh, main uh, period uh, where he really uh, <clears throat> became the most, clearly the most powerful uh, uh, politician that is uh, from late 1912. Uh, uh, so after this putsch and when he starts, uh, uh, also call for war in the, the first Balkan wars because that of course was wanted also from the other side from the Balkan states and uh, but which then uh, brings the liberal conservative government down because it uh, fails in in in in, in uh, waging the war uh, and uh, this is the chance for him so so from 1913 he, he clearly stands as the powerful man even if at that time we may call the situation a triumvirate with however a dominant person, but they three, Enver Pasha, Jamal Pasha and Dalat Bey, they are all three in Istanbul. So it's not wrong to call it a trium- triumvirate as Louis Rambert, for example, also does in his diary, in his contemporary diary. Uh, afterwards, uh, it, this changes. So, so afterwards, uh, it's better to call it now from another angle, a doom virate of Gökalp and, and Talat. So the executive Gökalp, who is the ideologue and, and mentor, of Nash, mentor of the CUP, Zia Gökalp. How could he do? So in, in that situation is comparatively clear uh, in the sense that he was the party boss, so he was the person who had the strongest position within the CUP and within the central committee of the CUP because he had been already the main networker in Saloniki, because he always had been particularly courageous. He always was present. That is a very important distinction uh, vis-a-vis others, Enver, for example, Cemal, he always was present. So he could impose himself over the years uh, together with uh, the other uh, uh, qualities that he had. So he was the party boss, that was absolutely clear. And he was the only one among in, this, in the central committee who had a long experience, not only in the parliament as a deputy, but in the cabinets. So he could accumulate his party uh, capital with the capital of his experience as a minister. And in this he was best. Nobody had the same luggage with him than he. 
Of course, you might also ask what were others uh, character, personal qualities that allowed him to, to combine then these main uh, power sources, the government and the party. Uh, he, he really was married to the cause, absolutely. He, he lived for this, that was his life from, I would say, from, from the eve of 1908. So that's one, of course, important factor. He was a bit outside, so he did not go to a military school. Uh, so he, but at the same time, thanks to his courage um, and his commitment, that he, by the way, was very able to display all the time. He all the time could make believe people that he was the most committed of them all, uh, uh, if he was or not. But he was able to, to, to, to, to make believe uh, all young and, and, and more recent also party members. Uh, so he had a loyal circle of, of, devoted, uh, of devoted governors or, or other collaborators around him. Yeah, and he was uh, now talking about personal qualities. He had a charm. Yeah, I was going to ask yeah. you about that. You, you're talking about a very charismatic and also mm. very often sad, almost melancholic person yeah. who, who, is, who is seen as a very likable, personable figure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. in Istanbul at the time. Yes, I, I, I even say that, or that's my analysis, he could use melancholy, especially vis-a-vis -vis Javid, as a weapon. Mm -hmm. Again, again, to, because Javid, uh, uh, he, he always turned back to Talat. He never left Talat, by the way, until the end. And in critical situation, Talat had to become sad. And then Talat, and then Javid became weak and again turned to him. So, yes, uh, there was, uh, let's say, a very high emotional intelligence in Talat, at least on this level of uh, managing relationships. And manipulating, perhaps. But also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, I mean, your writing makes me think. So it's also very nuanced, and I appreciate that you, while we're talking about this dictator, this monster with an iron fist, as we will see in the you know year 1915, you're also you have a very nuanced look into his personality, and I'm I would like to read a small passage in a minute, but I want to ask you about his ups and downs what you call in the book his crisis. You talk about Talat's crisis. Uh, you said you, uh, he was married to the cause, but he also was married to Hayri Hanum, of course, and he finds out he's unable to father a child. And, and so there is that perhaps a certain kind of burden on him, but also in, was it in 1911 when he, uh, he is the minister, he decides, almost, I would say, out of the blue to resign. And many people cannot understand why he is resigning at the time. And he says, I cannot resist anymore. So what was his internal conflict? What was he, you know, divided about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's, of course, a good question. And I would say it's, um, a multi-dimensional crisis, um, a deep crisis um, in 1911 or so, that only ends then with, uh, with uh, the second half of, the, of 1912, when he reinvents himself as, as I write. So there was this personal aspect. He would have liked, as most people, to have a normal family with children, and we do not know. This could have changed to a certain extent, his, his political ambitions, for example, could have temperated them. 
Uh, but then now more on the level of the political biography, it was really the end of his belief in parliamentarism, in a parliamentary system, in a constitutional system. So you have uh, certainly observed that I take uh, Talat absolutely not in a determinist uh, way, but I see him as a quite open politician in 1908 and 1911, of course, with, with all his, uh, his uh, preconditions uh, after all his uh, underground work, uh, but still uh, he, uh, not for no reason, he was seen as a promising figure by many, as, as a new face of constitutional Turkey in 1908. So he, in a way, wanted uh, to fulfill also the constitutional expectations that were on his shoulders. And he realized that he was not able to do so. And part of the constitutional expectations or, or, or rule of law expectations was, of course, the Armenian questions or question, or more concretely, the agrarian question in the eastern provinces. The Armenian uh, comrades were hopeful that Talat would help, would be able to help solve the agrarian question, which was the concrete core of the Armenian question. That is uh, the issue of lands that had been stolen or, or where it was unclear uh, and, and where uh, a, a functioning administration would, would have uh, clearly uh, uh, <clears throat> restored land to those who were the, the real owners, but this did not happen because there was no function, function, functioning state in the in the in the eastern of province, course, provinces. Resulting, sorry, this is, of course is resulting from 1890s, 1895. This is largely resulting from then, also from other incidents, also partly from earlier on. But yes, that that was the most marking uh, uh, and traumatic uh, moment, uh, sure. So uh, he uh, uh, was seen as the person perhaps capable of solving even this issue and of fulfilling important expectations of the Young Turk Revolution. And he must realize, and of course it was, this was not his fault or not, not his fault alone, that he was not able to fulfill this all because there were also the other expectations restore the empire save the state make turkey great again or make the ottoman empire great again and uh, and and he realized in 1910 11 that it was impossible there was a a, a, a collision of different expectations and uh, he had to take sides. Uh, one might say he had already taken side. I am cautious. I say he was quite open, at least until uh, 1911. And then comes come this crisis, also politically, very clearly, but also personal. And then I would say, together with the coup in July 1912, with the real risk that the CUP would be destroyed once and once for all by the new government, uh, with the situation of a possible war in the Balkans, he embraces Gökalpianism or the new uh, the new spirit that Zia Gökalp, of course, also a child of his time and of those years, exactly. Gökalp was also for a moment a constitutionalist, just in the aftermath of, 
of, of the, also in the, during the Ottoman spring. And uh, he, uh, how much uh, he, he was influenced or not exactly then by Gökhal, but I would see this together. He really, uh, he really embraced the radical solution. He had already this penchant for radical solutions, but now he did this also in regard of such fundamental issues like uh, constitutional uh, rule, parliamentarism, and so on. He clearly opted then for war. So he, they called for war. They organized meetings that called for war. I mean, he became when another. Monster. I mean, also uh, in the Balkan Wars in, in, in 12, 13, and also for the World War One, and he was a warmonger. He was absolutely, really absolutely fighting. Yeah, for that, it. And at exactly. a time when the Ottoman Empire was bankrupt, the military was in very bad shape, especially during the Balkan Wars, which you know brought about the disaster at the end. Yeah, but it brought power to the COP. That was the good thing, and that was was what Talat first wanted. He wanted to regain power, even if it was after a defeat, because defeat brought power to a new government. Mm -hmm. Defeat allowed a putsch. If the liberal conservative government would have been successful in war, the putsch would not have a good chance to succeed. Mm, that's true. And you also mentioned that the, the so-called reconquest of Edirne is also very much Talat. Sure. Talat. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. We see this very clearly from especially Hayris, uh, uh, also the, the Sheikh Al Islam Hayri Urgu plus uh, yeah. uh, diary. He describes this clearly. Yeah. I, I would like to go back to the Agoka, but let me read this one sentence from your own writing from the book, from the English version. You say, and this is describing the time around 1911, I think, 1911, 1912. There was a soul in Talat's breast that cared about the Armenians. And he knew well that cooperation with them was the key for a modern constitutional Turkey. You say he knows this, he understands this. And you know, this sentence with what will come afterwards doesn't really, you know, quite you know what I mean? Blonde here. It, it's just it's just very striking that he has the sense. Uh, I would like to ask you about you mentioned it a little bit just now, but about Gökhalp's Turanism and and this mix of religion with with the with the Turkishness, Turkism, and how perhaps for Talat it made clear that the roti would take, would exclude non-Muslims? Uh, also now the question exactly is, uh, is uh, that I describe uh, uh, this new Gökalpian uh, ideology that emerges uh, from 1912, yeah, we, we, can, mm -hmm. we can clearly say this. Yes, um, so uh, as I see, uh, Gökalp, of course, uh, all, was also a member of a cohort, and there are many other names that we co co can, uh, can uh, mention, but he is a little bit like Talat in the field of, of politics, clearly the dominant figure uh, in, in, in the prefiguration, prefiguration and mentorship uh, for nationalism, for a new kind, for a new understanding of the of the of the nation. So the new understanding, the Kalpian understanding of the nation, uh, contrasted clearly with the constitutional understanding of the Young Turk Revolution. The understanding that Gökalp uh, spreads from 1912. There are very important poems published in 1912, 13. Among them, Kuzlelma, uh, Turan, and, and also very martial poems, uh, uh, Askerduas, for example. Uh, uh, so, this is uh, 
a nation that is not the result of a modern negotiation of a social contract that is then codified in a constitution, but on the contrary, that does not need a social contract. As he writes himself in essays, one must read Gökhalp's essays, one must read his poems, one must know his, uh, his role in the Central Committee, only then one understands Gökhalp. So it's not enough just to read essays. So he re rejects a social contracts because he believes in the given, in the given nation uh, that is in an essentialist nation. And Turkishness is, is an essence that cannot be questioned, that is given. Even, of course, he says it depends on upcoming, on culture. But it depends to such an extent on culture that it is no longer different from race. You, you cannot assimilate to this, to this Turkishness at the end, or, or, or only very exceptionally you can assimilate. One sees the historical example of the Jews, who were very eager of, of some prominent Jews like uh, Tekinalp or, um, or, or others, uh, Galanti and, and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, th there are, are a few examples who really wanted to be a part of this new Turkish understanding of a nation, part of this nation, but they remained outsiders. So, uh, in short, Turk, uh, Gökhalp's culturalist understanding of the nation, so that, that was the new 1912 uh, understanding, is close to a racialist understanding of the nation. What is to a certain extent particular is that it is an ethno-religious understanding. So Islam also plays a very important role in his understanding. Uh, even if then uh, after uh, uh, his, he went to Ankara and so on, he, he to a certain extent downplays the pillar of his of this this pillar this religious pillar of the understanding but he nevertheless uh, then still integrates uh, the islamic element as an element of a culture which is unique in contrast to civilization which is universal which is is basically western which is the progress that at any price, uh, Turkey must uh, uh, also um, uh, attain and acquire. Uh, but the nation itself, that is, those who are called to construct the new Turkey, because they all the time talk about new Turkey in the early 1910s. Yeni Turkey, Yeni Yasham, Yeni, etc., etc. All is Yeni. All, all must become new. Like now. Uh, like now. I keep talking it's... about Yeni Turkey now. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, and there was no place, at least no equal place, no place in the sense of a modern social egalitarian social contract in that in that essentialist understanding of the nation that uh, Gökhalp very clearly starts to spread from 1912 together with Marshall poems. So this warmongering and this understanding of nation goes together for logical reasons. Yeah. And then combined with, with that, also the religious aspect of that, when Talat goes to war, finally he gets what he wanted. It's as you define in the book, it's total war. And you all also use the word jihad. So it is all encompassing for him. And of course, 
we are also talking about the time, I mean, let's talk about the economics a little bit here, where, where the empire is in need of money, uh, in need of managing its debts and, and, and, and is looking out and figures in CUP also are looking out for um, European nations who can help who they could uh, form alliances with. And one interesting aspect of the book is, is, is the parts about Churchill. Um, you talk about his, his private visit in 1911, I think, when he comes by himself and he's, he's with, there's this wonderful photograph of Talat on, you know, side by side with, with, with, with Churchill talking. And Churchill, of course, was born the same year with Talat. I mean, they're exact contemporaries and they have, uh, they form some kind of relationship. But um, Germany is there. Germany, as Churchill also has observed, who also is, is very sympathetic to the young Turks, uh, the so-called young Turks uh, at the time. Uh, as he observes in Istanbul, Germany is, is, is much uh, more, um, what's the word for it, successful uh, in its diplomacy in Istanbul. And, and, and are there, the Germans are there to help and to, to, to, to, to, to offer um, financial breakthroughs when, when needed. Um, there is one, uh, uh, I think, letter written to, to Churchill later on when he is the minister of the navy uh, yes. in in in london uh, for a certain for forming a certain alliance and he says no and talat mm -hmm. is part to that letter he doesn't write the letter himself but i guess talat Javid, yeah. Javid wrote Javid it right. and Hali de edip uh, translated Hali, Hali translated it. That. yes yeah. That's, that's and uh, yeah yeah that's that's interesting because it, it's about expectations. It's it's about uh, let's say hopes. Uh, so the hope is that these young people, so this young Churchill and these young guys in Istanbul, uh, this a lot of hope for the future, for for a different new future. They could understand one the other via a letter, uh, and the letter would be look what happens now in in Libya in Tripoli. So these Italians, like uh, imperialists, uh, really as imperialists, they invade Libya. That's the worst uh, European imperialism that you can imagine. Uh, and then they think this young Churchill must understand this. It's, uh, they are right to a certain extent. It, it's so clear. All, for all Drambert, it was absolutely clear that the, the Italians were dis despicab despicable. Just they, they behaved uh, in, a, in an unacceptable way. But Churchill was part of an imperially biased government. So <laughs> the answer finally was a very polite no. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and so it, that's uh, one of the elements that then led to this excuse, much repeated excuse, we were driven into the hands of the Germans by the others, yeah. yeah. But also, you know, then they're left with Germans, they go to war on the side of Germans. And as the war continues, as uh, there is this um, uh, victory in, in Chanakkale, uh, let's, uh, now we are in year 1915 and, um, and we are in the month of April now. And in, in a few days, uh, we will have the um, anniversary of the, I wouldn't say the Armenian genocide per se, but at the beginning, the first um, violent act of genocide, uh, which happened uh, on the 9th of April 24th, which was the attack on, on the elite intellectuals, Armenian intellectuals in Istanbul and elsewhere. Uh, we're talking about a time when Talat is very much in control. It's his doing. The genocide, I mean, I read a lot on the genocide. It's not my first time, you know, reading these, these um, um, approaches, let's say, and also references to certain documents. But in your book, it's very clear that that the first telegram to Enver, you know, that, that infamous telegram, and then and and then the letter to um, who is who is it at the time, Said Halim, 
Is it in Chemal about uh, now sending the people not to, yes. to the interior, but yeah. to, to Syria? Mm. Yeah, the second, the second about Jamal, but also he, he writes a letter to, I think, Said Alim Pasha, and then... The, ah, yes, of course, in May, yeah. Mm. Yeah, in yeah. May, and then, then works on the decree. He, he, he managed sure. this, this decree comes about. So all these stages of the genocide, the first violent acts of genocide, you portray a man, the leader, Talat Pasha, Talat Bey, uh, leading, he's still not a Pasha, by the way, it's Talat Bey at the time mm. still, he's leading, he's making decisions, he's calculating, he's very well aware of what he is doing. And he knows he's also breaking the Ottoman law. He, mm. he is breaking the Ottoman constitution. The decree comes after the fact uh, decrees come after the fact. Uh, so describe, if you will, his mindset at this time. I mean, you talk about him writing in his notebook. This is, uh, this is obviously demographic engineering, social engineering. This is social Darwinism, racism. Uh, but how much of it was a very pragmatist need a strategic decision, how much of it was ideological, and was he really aware of what all of that would amount to? Yeah, I, I believe so, that he was aware of what this uh, meant for the Armenians. I, I think that's your uh, now your uh, concrete question. Uh, and um, but for the rest, all elements were in the picture. Strategic, security of empire, the new vision for Turkey as a fully sovereign Turkish haven or Turk Yurdu. Uh, so uh, he uh, was the man able to synthesize these elements and to use the opportunities to bring things forward according both to the conditions of the time and the visions, the new visions uh, that were uh, in place. Uh, and uh, he, I say that he was in a way the most happy in that year because the most active really, as is described by this uh, German journalist, uh, from which I quote several times, uh, this was a man who was fully in action. And he, he is, let's say, a signature man of action, homme d'action, tatmensch in German. That's why the Germans admired this new type of of man of action who, who was able to, to, to withstand all kinds of resistances and, and, and problems and the conflicts and, and act and act out of such, uh, of such uh, tumultuous uh, situations. So he was very calculated in spring and summer. 1915 uh, and uh, he was very happy and proud about what he had achieved. Uh, that is very sad to say, very, very, very sad to say, because in this way he inscribed such a criminal, mass criminal act into Turkish history in a spirit which, uh, which haunts Turkey to this day. Uh, so he, he, yeah, he was high, politically speaking, speaking in terms of a man of action, proud about having achieved much more than Sultan Abdul Hamid had achieved within 30 years. Let me, yeah, let me quote you on that. You say he was boasting uh, for having accomplished 
more in three months about crushing the Armenians than Abdul Hamid could do in 37 years. Mm. Mm. Yes, and Sia Gökalp, uh, that's the ap apex of it all, writes a rhapsody for the father of the nation, for the prophet, even prophet Noah, uh, who saved the nation and the nation would have been, uh, would have uh, been orphaned without him. So that's where Siyak Kalp clearly uh, makes Talat a father of the nation because the nation would be orphaned without him, meaning he is a father figure for the nation. And that's, that's, uh, that's uh, a, a, a poem published 1st of September 1915, exactly after the successful first phase of the, the Armenian genocide in Asia Minor. The second phase is the one then in Syria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, he of course um, orders sending of thousands and thousands of people and mostly women and children because men were already killed, you know, mostly mm -hmm. women and children uh, sent into, into desert in Syria. Uh, what was the toll and I'm sorry, but I'm asking about the human toll of the decisions made by Talat in the year 1915. So you are talking about the Armenian deaths. Yes. Or Armenian deaths. Yeah. Uh, so he he has his notebook, and he he uh, in a way proudly noted, or at least soberly noted that he had removed now, of course, uh, I do not know by heart, but more than a million Armenians from, from, uh, from Asia Minor. And there are a few provinces that he, and places that he do, does not mention. So, so this is not a complete figure, but already this figure is more than a million. Uh, now, so these are the removed, they, perhaps a half survived and went to, into these extremely poor and provisional camps in the Syrian desert, in which, according to Talat, a year earlier, when, it, when they talked about the Muajir in the parliament, said that people would die there in the Syrian desert. That's his words when he is answered to Emanuelidis what would be when Muhajir would be sent to the Syrian desert. Uh, yeah, and we know that uh, thanks to Cemal Pasha, uh, perhaps 150,000 Armenians, as uh, Armenian survivors, were formally Ismail Islamized and sent further to the south and saved in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, one may add others who could escape. Uh, and we know then also of the final massacres that, uh, according to, to the Swiss teacher who, who was then leading uh, partly legal, partly illegal uh, work uh, for orphans and the illegal work for those in the camps, not saving them, but say, at least saving them we think of you, you are not to totally forgotten. So for she wrote that more than 50,000 were massacred at the end, that is summer of 1916. We have now a very recent research by Kachik Muradian, mm -hmm. who has really done a whole doctoral dissertation about the issue. He says that between 100 and 2,000, that, pardon, 100 and 200,000 surviving Armenians, astonishingly surviving Armenians, seeing the conditions, those who survived still until the, the, the, the summer 1916 were massacred uh, east of Teresor. So what was the toll? A million Armenians were killed. Let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. 
And when this is happening, as he's making these orders, Krikor Zohrab confronts him, basically asks him what he is doing and um, calls him to account. And of course he doesn't. Uh, and this is a man he, he has worked with in the parliament together and they have cooperated in the past. And uh, remind us, if you will, what happens to Zohrab and what happens to Serangulian, also another, another deputy, again under Palat's orders. Yes, uh, as a boss, uh, were not part of those uh, already arrested in the night, during the night of 24th to 25th of April. Uh, Zohrab uh, played cards with Talat in the, I think, what the 1st of June, and in the same, during the same night he was arrested. And before he had tried to, to, to, to intervene, to, to recall to his uh, CUP comrades, but in particular to Tala, that they were Ottomans, that they, they had worked for the Ottoman uh, constitution, for the Young Turk Revolution, and uh, that in his capacity of an Ottoman deputy, he uh, deserved answers from Talat. And Talat's reaction is to totally from the above down, uh, that is from a power holder down to a victim who has no longer in Talat's eyes any influence, any power, but who is totally dependent on him uh, so uh, Talat did not long think about the aftermath, about what would think the world a century later, and, and who would be the credible person, the one uh, whom the posterity would uh, miss in contrast to him. Uh, so then, finally, after the, this first uh, June, he was, uh, sort of, uh, was arrested and they were sent together with Serin Gulian to so-called trials in the Arbak here. Everybody knew, everybody who had any idea of, of what was going on, knew that this was de facto a death sentence because people did not arrive there. And Javid, by the way, writes this very clearly in his diary. So this is a death sentence. This is extremely shameful. And nobody uh, intervenes as a no, not um, the number four, uh, forgotten his name now. You know whom I mean, the number four in the CUP. Uh, also foreign minister then, uh, the quadrum vir. Uh, he, as a child, it was totally disappointed about these uh, really coward comrades because he was then in Berlin, so he could not, not directly intervene, who did not in any way move anything in order to, to save this wonderful uh, uh, uh, partner they had had uh, during all these years. And in fact, they were killed near to Urfa, and we have very clear reports on this by a Swiss doctor who lived at that time in Urfa, who even had, also his colleague had to, had to write down a totally falsified uh, medical uh, attest on the, on the death of, uh, of Zohrab. Mm -hmm. But Jemal Pasha reacted against this. Jemal Pasha had a kind of an imperial honor. And he brought those, of course, not those who were really responsible, but at least the, the killers, he brought them to, to trial and, and hanged them. Yeah. Uh, there's this amazing letter Zohrab writes on mm. the way to the Arbaker, I think, from Konya, somewhere. From Konya, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Would you like to say a few things on that? Uh, you might read it. I'm I'm trying to find it, but I'm uh, as I'm trying to find it. Do you want to describe it? Also, it's a it's a very dignified uh, language in which he 
again or a last time tries uh, to speak to the old partner and comrade Talat, but as I said, Talat was a new person, a reinvented, radicalized person who was no longer uh, in any way attainable uh, by a human language from human to human. So this is a, is a, is a very, very sad, uh, very, very sad, um, uh, how to say, legacy that he left to his country. This blocking of a human dialogue in a decisive situation, but uh, preferring uh, killing. Mm -hmm. The simp seemingly simple way to get rid of, of an adversary, of, of, of, of a difficult or challenging situation, mm -hmm. perpetuating the, the problems, e even worse. Leaving a legacy of, of uh, criminality. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I lost the post-it, which was marking that that um, you know, paragraph in the book, but uh, another reason for the readers to buy the book and and, and to look for that. Um, it, it's, again, it's uh, to me uh, valuable and important that you mention Jamal Pasha's um, reservation or at least uh, a more honorable attitude and, and at least an effort to save at least some, uh, some of the victims. Uh, was Enver an onlooker? Enver was not an onlooker. Enver was absolutely in favor of destroying the Armenians. Uh, even if uh, Talat was the main organizer or architect of destruction, Enver was, uh, was a strong advocate of destruction right from the start. So, so we should not too much detach Talat from the committee. I, I, I wanted to really to emphasize this. He was within the committee, the most dominant person, but who mirrored the others. So that's the way he, he proceeded. He, he mirrored or he synthesized the others. So he was not a detached person like Mustafa Kemal, who, who gave orders from, from above. So Enver was uh, very clearly an advocate of destruction. And this went on even in summer 1918. We have an, a, a telegram to one of his generals who, who advanced uh, in the Caucasus and in which uh, he very clear, clearly writes that the Armenians must be destroyed, uh, uh, not, perhaps not totally annihilated, but nearly. They should be made unable to reorganize themselves politically. So there is this anti-Armenian hate and, and exterminatory stance uh, that we see uh, as clear in Enver, or perhaps clearer even in Enver than in Talat, because Talat had been a partner of the Armenians for a, uh, for a certain time, not Enver. Okay. And I want to ask you about the German complicity. And I know you have written elsewhere about this. I have read your, your article on, on that. And it's also clear in this book that they do have these conversations with the several German representatives in Istanbul at the time. And if not a clear green light, they do receive some kind of, okay, you know, we won't speak up against it from the Germans, don't they? Uh, <clears throat> let's be very precise. <clears throat> also, there were certain German officers, not notably Hans Humann, who was fully in the line of Enver. By the way, he was a close friend of Enver. Uh, that is total approval of the 
extermination of the Armenians. And he bluntly write, wrote about this in German. They deserved to be annihilated because they uh, uh, damaged our war efforts. But this was the opinion of, uh, of an influential officer. There were a few others like him. But the diplomacy, the German diplomacy, never uh, in any way explicitly approved of this, uh, of this uh, way to deal with the Armenians. They approved in uh, early June 1915 of what Enver proposed, probably sent by Talas, proposed, because Enver spoke German, proposed that they had to remove certain Armenian families from the, from the near the war zones, and they had to close a few Armenian schools, they had to close a few Armenian journals. So a very belittling language, euphemizing language. Uh, and so, of course, you are right, the Germans closed both eyes. They did not want to understand that this meant much more than what Enver said at that moment. But uh, they uh, remained on the position, uh, and we see this also towards the end of the war, that the Armenians must come back into their possessions. So, they never, German diplomacy never endorsed the Armenian genocide and the results of the Ge Armenian genocide. But they remained extremely uh, coward, extremely irrealistic, irresponsibly irrealistic vis-a-vis -vis a partner they should have known better. Why? Because they were totally focused only on the military war effort. That all was about winning this war for the Germans. They did not understand that they were losing much more by wanting to win the war. They were losing their political soul. This had, has cost Germany very much in the decades afterwards. Mm -hmm. And in, in those decades, in about 20 years, uh, as you also describe in the book, uh, what happened in Daresor would become, if not a model, but a certain type of example of what would happen in Germany. So there is that linkage that Raphael Lemkin, who actually, you know, in Berlin would go and, and, and observe the hearings um, in which um, Tehlerian, wasn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. So he was not personally, he, he did not personally attend, but he, he observed very closely yeah, through observed the press closely. reports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry about this noise, but uh, uh, after that, you know, those proceedings played a part in his coming up with the word genocide. Uh, eventually, he, he, sure. was, he was mm -hmm. an observer of that. Um, after uh, the genocide, when Armenians were dealt with, so to speak. Um, we have, of course, from 1917 on, a full-fledged dictatorship. Uh, and the leader there is, is, is Talat uh, himself, because he becomes a Pasha, the honorific title of Pasha, the Grand Vizier, but he is also minister, interior minister. He is also, I think, a finance minister. He controls foreign affairs. It's almost a one-man regime, almost. And I understand your emphasis on CUP because, of course, they are very much there. Um, you also, in the book, talk about uh, this special organization, this Teshkilata Masusa, uh, and again, it goes against to what I used to know before reading this book, but 
it is not only Enver who controls them, Talat is also very much in control and orders them around. Let's talk a little bit on that also, please. Yes, so, uh, meanwhile, there is, a, there, there is uh, some more research on this um, uh, by, a pro by a professor at uh, Wilkent University, Özel, I, I think, Oktay Özel, if, if I'm not wrong. And, uh, but uh, it is also already in my book. Uh, I was myself uh, surprised uh, to see Talat so closely involved and being the addressee of Teskilati Marsusa people. Uh, so that Teskilati Marsusa that uh, totally failed, or let's say that became in a way useless because the campaign and invasion of the Caucasus failed in uh, late 1914, these Teskilati Marsusa people uh, that was then used during the Armenian genocide. Uh, this was uh, to a large extent in a close uh, communication uh, with uh, Talat, so that we see in, in those telegrams that, that are accessible, uh, often uh, Talat as, as, as, as a correspondent and, and as a leading, as, as, as an order giving correspondent in in the, in the correspondence with the uh, Teshkilati Marsusa people. Also this is notably Bahitin Shakir, Ömer, Nachi. And uh, so those who, who were in their room and uh, yeah, uh, corresponded from there. Uh, the Teshkilati Marsusa uh, was the private army of the of the of the party, it's so a paramilitary organization. A paramilitary organization, yeah. And the party was Talat. So it's uh, even if uh, there are a, a couple of differentiations that we can make. So it, it started with uh, with uh, an irredenta that the uh, Teshkilati Marsusa should. Uh, uh, should begin in after the Balkan Wars in the lost in the lost territories, uh, ev and even one can say it partly started already in Libya. But uh, we see it uh, in in terms of an organization that then continues uh, in the in the late 1913, uh, and uh, so then uh, it it is uh, rather uh, in a in a connection with Enver, but already when we see the Teshkilati Marsus again, uh, a few months later, terrorizing the room in the region of Izmir in order to expel them. And they are very successful, as you know. So uh, both tra tra Thrace, so Eastern Thrace and, uh, and uh, the region of Izmir taken together more than, much more than 200,000 uh, uh, room, they, they succeed in expelling by uh, terror without much murder, certain murders, but it's not a mass killing, it's, it's just terrorizing, intimidating people in their villages. So we see again Talat with having the lead. So Talat was very close, of course, to this uh, mili paramilitary organization of the party. He was the main party boss. Yeah, also because Teshkilati Masusa became a tool of Talat's demographic engineering. Sure. As yeah. you just described. What do you say to the, um, to the thesis that, to the understanding that, yes, there was Teshkilati Masusa, there was the CUP's paramilitary organization, but for example, Armenians had their own, you know, paramilitary organizations, their own gangs, there, there, there was a rebellion. And, you know, they, the part, of the, part of what happened in 1915 had to happen because there was an uprising uh, in the making. Yeah, also the, the military documents very clearly 
do not speak about the general. Explicitly say there was no general uh, rebellion in spring 1915. Which military documents? Uh, military documents uh, that were then published by the Atase in Ankara. So they have uh, published, uh, edited, published uh, eight volumes together with the index volume. And you find the documents. Uh, so documents made, reports sent from Erzurum. So they, they, are not, they are not able to, to use the situation for a general rebellion. So even in, in a way, in a, in a denigrating tone, uh, because there was chaos and, and, and they could, if they would have been, uh, if they would have wanted or been so well organized, they could have done or, or one could have imagined that they would do a general uprising, but there were uprisings or self-defenses at certain places. So it's a difference to speak about, uh, let's say, Russian-sponsored uh, general uprising uh, or, or British-sponsored or whatever you, you want to say, and largely self-defensive uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, <clears throat> incidents, uh, armed incidents, uh, as is what comes from the sources. Uh, and uh, this is something uh, that is uh, clear uh, but, and that is logical. Of course, uh, Armenians uh, wanted to defend themselves. They were even encouraged in the aftermath of 1908 by the CUP to arm themselves, to defend themselves against, for example, Kurdish tribes. Mm -hmm. So there, there was, of course, this, uh, this aspect of self-defense uh, at several places, uh, but it was uh, largely unsuccessful, except uh, for example, yeah, except Musada, and, and partly one but only partly in one. But it's, it's for a, a historian of greater Europe, it's absolutely not, uh, it, there is no surprise in this. Also, you see a lot of Jewish uh, resistance in Eastern Europe. That's something that sometimes is forgotten. Today is the Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, and the Israeli, the Israeli uh, newspaper just uh, two days ago, the Haaretz, has published about the forgotten Jewish resistant fighters in Poland. So they were networks of resistant fighters who, who fought during the war against, of course, the Nazis uh, who, who, who, who wanted to exterminate them or who wanted, yeah, who, who at least... It was not clear for everybody from the start that they wanted to exterminate them, but they knew that they did not want something good for them. So it's not at all surprising to see, of course, a threatened, a mortally threatened group to try to organize armed defense. It's, it's more than natural. The difference would be a truly elaborated system of, uh, of uprising in close uh, collaboration and coordination with the enemy. Only that's not what the sources, including the Ottoman sources, Ottoman military sources tell us. It's what Talat needed as his narrative in his telegram of 24 April 1915. Yeah. And uh, we have been talking uh, for nearly two hours, so I will um, have to wrap this up and I don't want you to tire you uh, much more, but not without talking about the end, of course, and, and, and Talat's narrative of events. Um, uh, in 1918, the war is lost, CUP uh, falls from grace, CUP leaders flee the country, Talat goes to Berlin. 
uh, exile in Berlin. And of course, another nationalist movement is, is emerging uh, in, in, in, in, in, Anatolia, in Anatolia under the leadership of Mustafa Kemal. Let's talk about two things. One, his memoirs, his apologia, as, as, as you call it. Um, what does he tell? What does he leave out? How does he portray what he did? Yeah, as a, let's say the, the first um, very striking element is that his memoirs, as what they have been seen since then, largely talk about the Armenians. So we see this is what occupied his mind. Mm -hmm. This he is. Knows. He knows. I mean, he knows he, what he did, so he... Sure, sure. It's his wound. Mm -hmm. It's, of course, also the contemporaries knew a lot. They knew a lot. They asked him all the time, uh, including, for example, Karl Radek in Berlin. So Talat connected very early on this important tie with the Bolsheviks. Already in early 1919, when Karl Radek was in prison after uh, Rosa Luxemburg's and Karl Liebknecht's uh, Spartacus uh, appraisal had failed. So in his memoirs, it's largely very defensive about the Armenians. Uh, he even, uh, he, he, it even uh, reproduces some, uh, some documents. So he wanted to prove his stance. It's, it's very defensive and very uh, uh, past-oriented. It's not future-oriented. Of course, you might say memoirs are always past-oriented, but memoirs could also have a vision. That's not the case. So he is, uh, one sees that he is no longer a politician capable of, uh, of a forceful vision, but he knows this. That's why he trusts Mustafa Kemal, why he collaborates and offers his services to Mustafa Kemal. He knows that from then on, it was another who had to take the lead. So if you compare Talat's memoirs with Mustafa Kemal's Nutuk, you see a very different uh, stance, a very different self-assertion. The one very much turned to this defense, to the, the defense of the past with exactly the same narrative elements that he always had used. So it's very disappointing from, from a, let's say, for, for somewhat, someone who, who would uh, uh, like to find something like a soul searching. The only point that in a way speaks for Talat in this context is that he refused to publish it. So he must himself be disappointed by himself at that moment. And whereas his comrades, his close comrades, uh, pushed him to publish and, and, and found that uh, a worthy piece, he did not. He did not. That's a very interesting point. One can read this in, in Talat's diaries. Uh, this, this, even if, unfortunately, a lot is, a lot is unknown about uh, the original, for example, of the memoirs. Nobody knows where it is. And nobody knows where is the German uh, version, which was then re-translated into Turkish, and which is lar largely the, the base for, for today's Turkish version. So, uh, but still, uh, thanks to Talat's diaries, uh, we, we see, we see a bit uh, what, and uh, yeah, we, we, we, we, we nevertheless know something about the history, but your question was, yeah, what, so it's largely defense, and also it is, um, yeah, it, it is an, an account of, of what he wants uh, uh, to be, and, and, and he uh, re represents himself as a Turk, Olu Turk. So he is, has a very Kalpian self-understanding so that uh, he needs to say that, uh, yeah, that he, he has the true identity 
needed uh, for his uh, position. And Talat, of course, is killed when he was in exile in Berlin in 1921, as we mentioned before. The last thing I want to talk about is, is the correspondence uh, between Talat and Mustafa Kemal. The letter he writes in 1919 and Mustafa Kemal's response in 1920, because you use those letters, that correspondence in your book as proof that there wasn't a clean break, that there was an affinity, there, wa there was a continuation, and that Mustafa Kemal wasn't necessarily all that different from the leader of the CUP, which uh, he, in many instances, uh, made an effort to show himself as separate, as unique, as apart. Yeah. Also, as I said, uh, Talat saw his role as a helper for the new uh, uh, movement to, to re-concentrate uh, power, to reorganize power in Ankara. So he fully approved of Kemal's effort. So he, he was uh, uh, much more uh, rapid in his understanding of the new situation compared to Kemal and to, and to Enver, uh, who, who much more followed the pan-Islamic, uh, pan Turkish uh, networks, whereas uh, Talat, as he was, by the way, already during all his time as a minister of the interior, remained concentrated or refocused on Asia Minor, uh, as the Misaki Mili, the national pact also, um, after the defeat in the imperial war, uh, uh, did. Uh, so uh, it is, yeah, it is uh, crystal clear that the reorganization of power in Ankara built very largely up upon uh, the still existing military forces of the uh, government before on the partners of the government before, inclu including, uh, including tribal leaders, and above all, abo about on the persons that close collaborators of Talat that went to, to Ankara, or those who had been part, being COP members or COP sympathizers, like the young people, for example, in Europe or in Switzerland, in the Turk, Yurdulara, Mahmoud Esad, Boskur, Chukri Sarajolu, and others who became ministers afterwards. Uh, they, they were clearly pro-COP people, very young people, uh, and, and also very, uh, let's say, um, very uh, influenceable people. So they were ideal for a kind or for a certain break in Ankara. But that does, did not say that this whole grounding work that I have mentioned and which of which certainly the most incisive was the demographic engineering, was fully approved of and used for the new projection, for the projection of the new state. There was absolutely no uh, questioning of these results. On the contrary, when the whole war for Anatolia, the Istiklal Savasha, uh, as Harba or Kurtulus Savasha, was largely a war to maintain the, the achievements of what Talat had done in Asia Minor. So that no Armenians could come back, could reclaim their properties, or even have an autonomy, or even have a micro-autonomy. That was the last very sensitive point in Lausanne, 
in January, early January 1923. Total no. Rosanur stands up and, uh, and leaves the meeting uh, to say once and for all, we are unspeakable on this topic. And they all accept this because they wanted to compromise with the new power holders. They did not have. They had other priorities, the mandates, the finances, the Ottoman debts, the, the future economic relations, and so on. So, yeah, of course, Mustafa Kemal uh, took his distance and, and built up a new republic, and it, this was an assertive secularism, but it was on the groundwork of Talat. It was the Gekalpian nationalism, even if Islam was to a large extent built out from this nationalism. But what I should have uh, also said about this nationalism and the Islamic part is a structural uh, reflection by Gökalp. Gökalp say, said that Islam was the most appropriate religion for a modern state because it did not separate, separate between religion and politics. So this made a state, a state strong, this non-separation of. So it's, it's a kind of a totalitarian state in, in that, that you can formulate also in non-religious language, even if Gökalp uh, worded it in his religious language in, in an essay in, uh, I think, 1916. Uh, and, or it's a proto-fascism in, in another world. And uh, we can, unfortunately, even if we very, very much wanted, not say that the Republic of Turkey was democratic after 1923. On the contrary, it very quickly and logically against this background became a leader-led single party rule. Even if it repressed Islam, the idea of the state was the Gekalpian idea of the state. So unitary state, one language, one leader, uh, and uh, the individual is in the service of the of a corporatist entity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but having said that, uh, Talat Pasha's remains were not brought back to Turkey during Atatürk's times. It, it was four or five years after his death that the government in Turkey made a move. Uh, they brought him back. They buried him and the rehabilitation, so to speak, of, of Palat Pasha continues ever since. Let's um, uh, finish with, with an anecdote you share in, in the Turkish version of the book. I didn't see it in the English, but it's very, very interesting. Not one I know before. Uh, I haven't had that read that before. It's uh, Jalal Bayar uh, mm. visiting Hayri Hanım. <laughs> Would you mm. want to share that, what he says there? Uh, Do you remember? Yeah, as a child, I had uh, said, my, my excellence, I, say, I think, or she, he says to Hayriya Hanan, and she's very surprised, why, why, why, why this title? And, she's, and he said, but you, you are the, the wife uh, of uh, Talat Pasha, my boss or my chief. Like chef him, chef him in. Chef him. So still in, when was it? In the 60s or so, Celal Payar was talking in these terms. So this shows how formative Itia Teraki and Talat as a person was for this whole generation of founders of post-Ottoman Turkey. We have to take this as it is, seriously. Absolutely. And on that note, uh, I thank you very much for this 
full two hours of conversation. Thank you for the book. Uh, Talat Pasha certainly casts a long shadow and I hope uh, your book and your research and um, uh, your narration narrative uh, will encourage uh, many of us to look deeper into the past in order to understand the present. You're welcome and thank you also for the conversation.